One of the most important bits of advice I ever got was when I started Hollywood Recording Studio, I called my old boss, Paul Emery, and I asked him for advice. I said, what do you recommend that I do? And he said, the most important thing you can do, and get this all the rock stars, the most important thing you can do is learn about publishing. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Howdy, rock stars. It's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars, the podcast bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Megan Gohill, a producer, engineer, musician, studio and record label owner in Hollywood, California. He has been recording for longer than I have, and the reason I know that is because it was Megan who recorded my first college band in St. Louis called Dr. Seuss. Of course, we spelled it with three S's. Go figure, ask me later. When I first got started recording with my four-track, Megan was the expert that I turned to for advice and microphones. He recorded many projects with me over the next couple of decades. Our first big release was for my band Enormous Richard, a twangy alt-country band from St. Louis, and we recorded 30 songs live to cassette in a basement in Granite City, Illinois, and went on to sell and distribute several thousand copies, nearly landing a record deal in the process. That was followed by Enormous Richard's Answers All Your Questions, our first CD release. And then later, we renamed ourselves Eleanor Roosevelt and made Walker With His Head Down with Megan for his college audio program at Webster University, where he studied under Barry Hufker and Bill Porter, who recorded Elvis, Roy Orbison, and the Everly Brothers. Not bad for teachers. After that was another basement record called Warm Milk on the Porch on 8-track cassette. And finally, our band breakup album, aptly named Crumbling in the Rain, which was live to two-track digital tape known as DAT, without headphones, from the living room of Megan's big old wooden house in St. Louis. Of course, like many band breakups, we got back together later to make more records, but, you know, that's another story. I'm sure I'm forgetting to mention many other sessions, but we can get to that during the interview Megan moved from St. Louis to Hollywood in the 2000s to further his recording and music career and has gone on to record with many greats, including Cure co-founder Lal Tullhurst's band Levenhurst, Trey Anastasio of Fish, Jack Johnson with the Animal Liberation Orchestra, Phil Lesh and Joan Osborne, Diggable Planets, and Michael Fronte, to name just a few. For 20 years, Megan has maintained a dual career in radio promotions and career development and management, working with many independent artists while he's been recording and operating his studio. He worked as the project manager at Contemporary Productions in St. Louis, SFX Entertainment, and Clear Channel Concerts, and he's also consulted with AEG Live and Emory Entertainment. Currently, he records from his home studio, which you can check out at hollywoodrecordingstudio.com and works as a strategy and analyst manager at Live Nation Entertainment's amphitheater division. Please welcome one of my longest friends, Megan Gohill, to Recording Studio Rockstars. Megan, my man, are you ready to rock, dude? Oh, yeah. I am ready to rock. (laughs) I should probably ask you if you're ready to twangy alt-country rock, you know, since that's really what we did so much of. Well, I've got a banjo sitting in the background, so uh, if we want to twang, we can twang. Nice, dude. I'd kind of forgotten about that, that you were always aspiring on the banjo about the same time as I was. So, rock stars, I played banjo. I still play banjo, fiddle, guitar, and Megan knew me through all those stumbling years of trying to pick up those instruments and learn how to make make sounds on them. But the very first cassette recording we did for Enormous Richard's Almanac was done in a basement session with uh, with with me playing some banjo. But um, anyway, Meg, tell us more about who you are and how you got into this. I've got kind of an oddball question I'm going to throw at you. Tell us, man, when you were starting out in recording, what did it smell like to you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I started recording when I was in high school. I would record the bands that I was in. 
Um, so it smelled like my basement. <laughs> nice. And um, I started, I was recording bands, playing in bands throughout high school and in college. One of my first uh, big breaks was when I got to, I got to do live sound for a band called Alizone in St. Louis. And they, they actually had their own PA system. So I would go in and mix their live gigs. In fact, it was their recording board that we used for the Almanac. Nice. Um, but I, I would go out, I would um, mix their live sound. So I got a lot of experience running front of house sound. And I would still try to record as much as I can with friends or on the side, wherever I could. It's interesting because I've heard so many people talk about live sound as a great entry point into the whole recording and, and studio thing. You know, what do you think was the carryover from going from live sound to, to the studio thing? What, what did you bring with you from live sound that other people might miss if they never do that? There's a lot of stuff. Um, when you're doing live sound, you learn about being prepared. So for me, that means whenever I have a recording session, I always have all the mics set up. I always expect that things will change, but I at least get them set up to an approximation that we can start out with. In live sound, you also learn about how the instruments all interact with each other. So you get to hear, like, how does a guitar and a keyboard work together when they're playing live? You get to hear various versions of the same mix over and over again, of the same band over and over again, if you're doing the same band every night. And afterwards, I started working at Cicero's, which is a club in St. Louis, where every night there was two different bands. So that got me in the habit of, of being able to do quick changeovers. And the PA wasn't that great, so I had to work with what I had, which meant SM58s and really bad mic preamps and everything like that. But I got the hang of it and... To me, that's my foundation of how I of how I record and mix. Yeah. So, a um, couple of things. Wasn't Cicero's Basement Bar? Wasn't that where um, Flock of Seagulls once disappeared with your AKG D one twelve kit drum mic? I seem to remember yes, they that did. story. They did. They. Uh, I was I was packing everything up, and all of a sudden, my microphone disappeared. And a few weeks later, I get a call from somebody in St. Louis who said, "Hey, Megan, I think I have one of your microphones." And I said, "How do you know it's one of mine?" And he said, it's got your name stamped on it. Nice, so somehow, dude. So somehow or another, the microphone ended up at the club that they played the next night. And word got back and I had my mic back. It's funny because I don't know that anybody would typically think of an answer to a question like, what's the best way to acquire gear? And for that <laughs> answer to be, just go ahead and stamp your name on the gear that you've already got, you know? Yeah. <laughs> But uh, I, I definitely do a lot of that. People look at me like I'm crazy because I print thousands of Toy Box Studio stickers and I just stick them on everything. And when the interns are here and they're looking for something to do, I'm like, here, take this pack of stickers and go around the studio looking for things that don't have stickers on them and put stickers on them. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know, granted somebody, if they want to remove a sticker, you know, hey, there's not, there's only so much you can do, but at least it gives people a chance to return stuff to you. Yes. Totally All right. Does. So tell us about Hollywood Recording Studio. I mean, you, you've actually had a, a lot of studios. Maybe just tell us about your whole evolution of the Megan Gohill Studio. Well, let's see. I started I, when I was when I was in bands. I would I had a Yamaha four track cassette that I would take with me from to wherever our rehearsals were, and I'd record our rehearsals. Most of the time, we'd record the instruments on one set of stereo tracks. Then track three would be the lead vocals. And track four would be the backup vocals. And that was kind of the whole carrying it around from place to place. When I was in St. Louis, I actually got enough recording gear. I got I ended up with an eight-track cassette unit and a DAT machine, which was that was like my ticket right there. I would record bands. I called it at the time Pelican Productions. I would record bands in my basement in St. Louis at a little house in Maplewood, Missouri. Yeah, I remember that. What where, where did the name come from? Why Pelican Productions? <laughs> We have to we have to thank Chris King for that. He had a stuffed pelican on the wall that he put on my wall, and <laughs> that was the nice. most convenient name. <laughs> That's the way all naming should be. Nobody should ever have to work so hard to try and pick a name. Just go with the first thing you see. Yeah, and when I moved to Hollywood, I um, I looked for the domain name Hollywood Recording Studio and. It was open, so I took it. <laughs> well, so. I know I was pretty impressed with that when I was thinking about that. I was, you know, especially in this day and age, now it'd be like. You know, to try and get Hollywood Recording Studio seems like it would just be impossible. 
you know. So well yeah. done, well done. Kudos to you for that. Uh, let's let's back up a little bit before we get to Hollywood too, because one of my favorite places to record with you was in that house, and I guess that's maybe the one you were just recording too. Was that the one in Maplewood that where we did Crumbling in the Rain, and it had that the big wooden staircase and the, all the open spaces? Yes, that totally was. It was an old house. It was probably about a a hundred years old, and that house had some history in it. Uh, there was another band that was recording there, that was living there at the time also. One, one of my roommates was Pat Malachek from The Urge. Prior to my moving in, there was Kip Louie, who plays with Brian Henneman of Bottle Rockets. Um, Kip plays in a band called Diesel Island with him. Kip would, had lived in my room before I had moved in there, and I had actually recorded his band in that house when he still lived there in the living room. Nice, man. Well, those are some pretty pretty impressive name dropping, too. I mean, Brian Henneman is a, a name that some people listening might know from the Bottle Rockets. And, you know, if you don't know the Bottle Rockets, you probably know Uncle Tupelo, which was a band he was palling around with initially, which went on to become Wilco and, and Sunvolt. Um, well, cool, Meg. So let's jump into some stuff, man. I like to ask our guests to share with us an inspirational quote to get started. You got anything for us to get us kind of excited about hitting the studio? Roll with it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. <laughs> that was uh, that, what what I, what I mean by that was um, when I do sessions. A lot of times, a lot of unexpected things happen, and the important thing about it was when something unexpected happens, you seize it, you grab it, you roll with it. You know, like I might go in there with the plan of okay, I'm going to record. You know, I'm going to put this layer of guitars and add a piano at the top and this, and suddenly somebody will walk in with a banjo and it's like, yeah. All right. <laughs> Scrap everything else. Just put the banjo in there. <laughs> I like it, man. Not everybody, you know, I got to say, not everybody says, yeah, when they see a banjo walk in the door. <laughs> Some people go, you know, they go, ah, yikes. <laughs> <laughs> so I like your attitude towards it. Well, so I think that's great advice. And and I'm trying to think of many examples of that. I mean, I, I've definitely experienced all sorts of examples of that in the studio. And I've even found myself thinking of ways to scheme to always be able to capture something. All the moments where I was on a session and I wasn't rolling or we weren't ready yet and somebody plays somebody else a version of the song in the studio and I hear it and I'm just like, ah, oh, that sounded so good. I wish I had a recording of that. And so then I started thinking of ideas. It was like, oh, maybe I can install, you know, like a surveillance system through this studio that's always running a 24-hour tape recorder. And, you know, then I'll just back up, you know, 30 seconds and capture, recapture whatever just happened. I was reading an article the other day about, I think it was like the Beatles sessions when they would record, they'd always have a two-track running in the background just capturing stuff so that they would have that to reference if they ran through a take and something was good. That's a great tip. In fact, I remember hearing that advice a lot when I was making records early on and we had DAT machines. There was yeah. always the suggestion, you know, just keep a DAT rolling the whole time because DAT tapes were pretty cheap. You could have a bunch of them. They would record for two hours a piece, you know, and you could just let them roll. You know, it's funny because in a in a big way, with the advent of the computer and the DAW, that has disappeared completely. I, I've noticed like a lot of the neat little things you could do with analog, you can't do with digital. So you're you end up like you you lose parts of the process that have there's parts of the process that have gotten lost. Yeah, like how would we have a, a two track rolling all day? Ironically, it's easier than ever to just have two channels recording all day long. I mean, you could just stream a YouTube video privately and capture two-track audio all day long if you wanted to. But I guess you'd technically want to set up a second computer, maybe if you had a laptop and you just have a digital feed going from your main Studio One over to that or something like that, you might be able to capture stuff. But with the DAW, Pro Tools, you know, any interface that you're using, you're typically listening while you're recording something. Um, and then if you're not in record or in that moment, you know, ready to capture, then no, there is no sound. Whereas on a tape machine or through a console, you might have always had the mics feeding something, even if you weren't rolling the tape machine. So interesting stuff, man. All right, Meg. So how about sharing with us a story about an important failure for you, or maybe like a nightmare in the studio? I got a really good important failure one. Uh, my very first, 
I'd been running sound for a band for a long time, and I finally decided I was going to make the break and get my own PA system, and and everything would be good, and I could I could run my own sound for different bands. And I thought that was a great idea. The only problem was. I didn't fully test everything before my first gig. <laughs> oh, so, so I get to the gig and I knew everything, I could hook everything up, but I didn't have it in a way that was efficient to hook up. So I could hook it up, but it, would, it took me hours to hook it up so much that the band was late on their first set. I could only get the vocals going through the PA, all kinds of mess. <laughs> so shortly after that, I decided, okay, I'm not going to do any PA gigs. I'm going to just set it up, tear it down, set it up, tear it down, and practice it a whole bunch so that the next time I go in, the next time I went in, I also went in extra early to make sure that I would be able to be fully set up. As soon as the band got in there, all they would have to do is plug in their instruments, and I'd just have to put the mics up. Yeah, that's so. great. That's you know, from the beginning of our talk here, you talked about the importance of being prepared for a live session. And what a great takeaway to transfer over to your uh, studio sessions, just in the simple idea that says, you know, studio sessions go better if you're prepared for them. And when you have that kind of practice from live, you're likely to get that in the studio too. I, I encourage a lot of people out there to, whenever you're, whenever you've got a band coming over to your place, to have just a rough idea of how many of what the drum set's going to be like, how many guitars, whether they're active or whether they're uh, microphone or they'll need a pickup uh, or if they need a direct box, all that kind of stuff. Get it all together, set everybody up where you think they're going to set up, or ask them beforehand, and then that way when they get there, they literally just have to plug in. So Megan, how about sharing with us also like an important moment of success or an aha moment for you in the studio when you've been recording? Well, um, one of the most important things that I learned, and it was probably about midway through when I was in St. Louis, was a trick of rolling off the lows. Very simple trick, but what it does is on guitars and vocals, all that low end stuff muddies up the mix. So you just roll it off a little bit, um, you know, on the on the vocals, on the guitars, all that kind of stuff. And then you'll what you'll notice is your kick drums and your bass and all those other instruments will pop through a lot better. A couple of interesting things. When you talk about learning that trick early on and you use the term rolling off, back then it literally <laughs> was an EQ on a channel on yeah. your uh, on your fader strip on the console, and you had to grab a knob and roll it to the left, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. I'll tell you, there's another little trick that that everybody that I, I I don't tell everybody about, but it's a pretty cool one. When you have a guitar player or two guitar players playing together, have them play on different parts of the neck. Okay, let's say you've got one. Let's say you let's say you've got a power a band playing. You know, everybody's playing power chords. Everybody's playing the same thing. One little trick you can do that's really cool, have one guitar player play just the low notes of the chord. So if you're playing a, an E chord, have one guy play the E. Have the other guy or, gir or girl play the B and the, and the higher E. And what that'll do is you'll get this, this sound that is very dimensional, like it'll come out of the speakers in a way that it, as opposed to having everybody playing the same chord. Yes. If you go root, fifth, root, or root, fifth, octave, with, with one guitar, it sounds completely different than going root with one guitar and then fifth and octave with the next guitar. Yeah, it's a good tip. I think one of the reasons for that, too, is that when you're, you know, you're probably talking about a distorted, crunching guitar tone, and it's like part of the distorted guitar sound is a limited bandwidth for what can come through. It kind of focuses the sound into this one thing, potentially. And so if you're trying to send three notes and three strings through that guitar sound, it's like there's a little less room for all of it to get through. Whereas if you cut it back to a single note or just the, you know, the, the inverted power chord, the fifth and the octave above, and layer that on top, the sound cuts through differently. You get a different mid-range, different sound altogether. So when you record like that, do you like to sort of do those pair of guitars on the left and then do a pair of the same guitar on the right. How, how do you like to do that with stereo guitars or layering? It depends on the song and the parts that come before it and the parts that come after it. So a lot of times with recordings, I try to open them up in terms of, I try to give space. And so sometimes the space is wide stereo width for one section 
And in another section, it's very narrow. So, you know, it's like everything down the middle. So it depends on the, on the song and the part of the song. Like I might, I might do the verse, maybe real open, heavy left, right panning. And when the chorus comes, comes in to really give it that punch, push everything right towards the middle and everything will just blast right through. Or it could be the other way around where the verse is very, very monophonic. And then the chorus comes in and it's all of a sudden you get this beautiful wide stereo. It, it just depends on the song and what comes before and after it. Yeah, it's like a scene change, right? It's like a, the contrast. Exactly, exactly. If you think about recording as a film, what you're looking for is places to add contrast and build up excitement and things like that. And then pull back on the excitement so that it's not just one steady thing coming at you the whole time, but there's parts from that the song takes you through a little journey from the very start of it till the very end of it. I'm sure when we recorded our records with you, we took you on a bit of a freaking journey, didn't we, Megan? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about that, man. Let's go down memory lane for just a sec. I mean, I remember um, with my first band, meeting you, or we had a chance to do some recording. I, I think I had bought my four track by that point, but I didn't have any microphones. You know, I think maybe I had one mic and and Joe, uh, Joe Armand, shout out to you if you're listening to this. But I, I think Joe probably had met you and, and we went over to your upstairs apartment and I'm like, man, who's this guy? It's got all this stuff <laughs> and mics and cool shit, you know? <laughs> and then we went, um, and I feel like we went over and recorded in in uh, my girlfriend, Heather. Heather, shout out to you if you're listening, um, in her basement um, to did. do some I stuff. And, and one of the cool things I remember is you had us use PZM mics and you said, you know, if you hang these in the air over the drums, they sound really good or behind the drums. And I was like, okay, cool. Because I knew nothing about recording, <laughs> like nothing at this point. And it sounded I, cool, man. I forgot that I, I used to have that PZM mic. I, I don't know. I got to dig that out. I forgot what happened to it. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think you stamped your name on it. So maybe I didn't give it back I, to you. Ah, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> um, and then, so let's see, then, you know, when we went on to record the Almanac, which I guess technically, um, were you there in, in the room with us during all that? You were kind of coming and going, right? You It was your studio, but we also had the sh the help of Sean, wasn't it? Right. What what ended up happening was I'd, I'd been mixing all night. I, I had a live gig the night before. We had to get there really early to Chris's sister's basement because that's where we tracked it at. That's right. And I got everything set up and I got the first couple songs. You know, we did some testing. And then every so often I just kept getting, I was exhausted. And so I, so I asked Sean to help engineer the recording. So Sean, who was the singer of the band that I was running sound for, ended up mixing a good chunk of that because I was upstairs trying to get some sleep while a band was blaring <laughs> right below me. <laughs> well, I mean, after all, we were trying to record 30 songs in two days from this basement. <laughs> but I mean, yep. to, to at least speed it up, we were doing it all live to cassette. So, you know, everything was mic'd up. Nobody had any headphones on. We're basically playing like a live basement rehearsal and it's all going through your mixer. And then he was, I think Sean had some headphones on or you did when you were setting it up. And then you know, a little bit of effects were added and it was just mixed straight to cassette and that was it. You know, we had what we had. Yep. I, I had I had a pair of LXP1 reverb units, um, which is where we added some of the what little vocal effects we added to it. Uh, other than that, everything was sure SM57s and 58s and a Tascam mixing board, which I still have to this day. Oh, do you really, man? I love I that really one. I really do. I want just the color scheme from that mixing board is so cool. <laughs> Well, I'll, t I'll tell you this, that that mixing board has a particular sonic color to it as well. Like when you, whenever I've recorded things through there, I can always tell that I ran it through that board because it has a particular set of tones. Um, yeah, it's, it's got very, a crunchy mid-range. Yeah, yeah. It's a really interesting, like it's it's a good character mixer. Like m different mixers have characters, can give a, char a particular sonic characteristic, and that one definitely has a unique characteristic that's great every once in a while. You know, what's funny is, um, I think we all probably go through this. At the time, 
at which that characteristic is our only limited option, we can be real grumpy about it and think like, oh man, I can't wait to get something better than this, you know? Mm -hmm. And then years later you come back and you're like, God, it sounded so good. What was I thinking? You know, so smart move to hold on to it for good. In fact, Nick Devan, who was just on the podcast for GED Records doing his soul label stuff, I think he had the exact same Tascam board in his studio. Nice. I just saw a video with um, Kim Deal and of the the Pixies, right. and she had in the background the exact same mixer, <laughs> the nice. same model, the same model. Not well, when you mixer. get it right the first time, why change it? All right. So, <laughs> so we did our thirty song cassette release with you, the Enormous Richard's Almanac, which is on. It's online. It's available. Rockstars, yes. you can check that out. I'll put links in Spotify for the show notes, and we'll make sure we link to all of our records on the on this episode. Um, and then Megan is, in fact, our record label for all of our distri- digital distribution. That's right. Hollywood Recording Studio. You can go to hollywoodrecordingstudio.com. And I've got a, a few of the artists that I work with are all on that website. Um, well, cool, Meg. Let's Let's actually transition to that for just a sec. You've learned a ton a ton in the time I've known you about what goes on outside of the studio. You know, the the label business, the radio side, promotions, um, management and touring. Can you give us a little bit of a, you know, synopsis or a, if that's the right word, uh, but tell us your story about doing that stuff outside of the studio. When I was in St. Louis, I just graduated college and I was looking for a job in a recording studio. And I called up one of the local recording studios, uh, Smith Lee Studio, and I talked to Dave Smith and I said, hey, I really want to work at a studio. Well, I want to work. And he said, do you want to work on commercials or do you want to work in music? And I said, music. And he said, I'll tell you what, there's a concert promoter that you should go work for that's in town. That was my first start into the actual business side of everything. So I went to work for Contemporary Productions in St. Louis, which did the biggest concerts in St. Louis. Everybody from Van Halen, they did Led Zeppelin, they did The Stones, um, every major concert that came through St. Louis, Kansas City, was done through contemporary production. So I got a real good working of the back background, the business part of it. Did you do the, Guns N' Roses? Did you do the big, the infamous Guns N' Roses concert? That was before my time, but it was the same company. <laughs> <laughs> this is the uh, and, rock stars. We're talking about the famous GNR concert in St. Louis, where they had a riot in the uh, the outdoor stadium. Yeah, or arena, 1991. I guess, right? It was a Riverport Amphitheater right after it first opened, 1991. Yep, yep. Those were those yep. were the days, man. Those were the days. So, <laughs> all right, we'll keep going here. So, contemporary well, productions. You started. Um, you started learning a lot about you know just ha- how to run and promote a concert. Yeah, it was. Um, you know, I, I started off as an administrative assistant, and I've worked a lot of different jobs within the concert industry. A lot of it on the back end. Um, you know, not I'm not the actual promoter, but I've been the uh, the person that analyzes a lot of the details that go on, um, creates a lot of spreadsheets, that kind of thing. One of the most important bits of advice I ever got was when I started Hollywood Recording Studio. I called my old boss Paul Emery, and I asked him for advice. I said, "What do you recommend that I do?" And he said, the most important thing you can do, and get this all the rock stars, the most important thing you can do is learn about publishing. All right. So tell us, what did you learn about publishing? It's the most important thing that you need to know. What did you learn? What can you share with us? First thing, always copyright your songs. Know that there's two copyrights. There's a copyright for the writer and the copyright for the people that create the sound recording. The people that create the sound recording include the producers the engineers, and the musicians. If you, want to, um, if you want to make sure you're doing everything ab- above board, then what you do is you, you make sure the writer gets their copyright for the songs they write. The musicians, the producers, the engineer, they all split the copyright. Or if somebody's, you know, or you can pay them off. In other words, get a producer release form, an engineer release form, a musician's release form, get, and get all that stuff in writing. Here's why. When the song, if you do a song and it does really well, you can get it placed into a television show or into a movie or into something like that. When that happens, you can make a lot of money in it. So one of the one of the important things, one of the questions they ask you is, do you have all your release forms? And if you say yes, then it's a very easy thing to 
to get published. A lot of times the publishing deadlines are really tight. Um, you might have 24 hours to turn something around. That could be a lot of money. And you don't have time to verify with every single person. Every if, if you do a regular copyright, you have to get a sign-off from every person that's on that copyright. If you do just a release form, then you've got the release form and you don't need to get the the signatures for everybody. So once again, this is being prepared in advance. This is making sure that you've got releases from everybody who might uh, hold, I guess, a lien on that song by having a, I don't know if that's the right word, but you know what I mean? They, they might hold a right to that song or a right to that recording because they participated in it. And you could find yourself at the door of opportunity, but you can't walk through it. Nice analogy, Lidge, because you don't have these release forms, which are the key to that door. Do you like that? You like how I dropped key in there? That's exactly the thing. That's exactly it. You got to have the um, the release forms. If you don't, then you know, you're not going to be able to shop the song adequately. All right, cool, man. Well, so now um, tell us about something that you learned as far as recording a great performance in the studio. You, know, you talked about live sound. I, I really liked your analogy w when you pointed out that what you learned from live sound was you got to hear the same song performed over and over. It's like you're r mixing the same song and you really get to know these subtleties of arrangement. But tell us about getting that great performance in the studio too. A lot of it is just about if it, when the, what I've noticed is when I show up prepared, that will set that helps set the band at ease because they know that that whatever they do, it's going to get captured. The other trick that really helps to get a good performance is you have the band warm up. You know, while they're warming up and setting everything up, hit record. After the after they're done setting up, just play what you did in the rec in the background and. Pretty much what all, almost always happens is everybody will gather around the speakers to listen. And that it really gets the vibe going because then people get to hear their own performances. A lot of times as an engineer, you don't need to say anything to musicians. You just play it back for them and they will hear what they need to do. That's that's some deep insight, actually. I, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I think that as engineers, as producers, as people who are trying to participate with our creativity into this group creativity in the studio, I think we have a tendency to want to talk too much. We have a tendency to want to contribute and feel like we need to open our mouths to say things and, you know, our response to what we just heard happening through the speakers. And you're so right. A lot of times, all you need to do is just play it back for the musician and they immediately hear it and they adjust and they know what they didn't do right and what they need to do right. Yeah, the second performance is usually a really good one. After everybody's had a chance to listen to everything, they people will intuitively pick up on what needs to happen. What about the 12th performance? How do you feel about the 12th performance, Mag? It depends on the band. You know, sometimes you can go through a bunch of performances. Um, you know, sometimes it's best to do a handful of, a handful of performances, do a few songs, and then listen to them all back. Usually, if, if somebody's having a problem with the song, it could, it could be a matter that they need to work it out. Sometimes what you do is you have them break down into sectionals. So what I mean by that is if a song isn't working, you say, okay, drummer, bass player, singer. Let me just hear the three of you guys play together. Okay, now, guitar player, bass player, let me hear you guys play together. Guitar player, keyboard player, let me hear you guys play together. And all of a sudden, when you do that, the musicians will become aware of each other's parts. It's not about me saying anything to them. It's about them hearing the individual components themselves. Nice, man. You're like the human solo button. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, Rockstars, you can't see Megan. I actually do see him while we're chatting here over Skype because he put his video up and he has a freshly shaved head. So human solo button. I mean, he's got his, his head's kind of like a button right now, man. He's nice. Anyway, all right. So uh, let's talk about headphones, Meg. You know, should we record with headphones on? Should we not record with headphones on? What are your thoughts? It depends on the situation. If you're recording, if I'm doing solo overdub tracking, there's, well, let me start with this. From an engineering perspective, you always want to get the cleanest signal possible. From a vibe perspective, Monitors can be a really good thing because everybody can hear themselves or sometimes not. If the band is really loud, sometimes you want to get everybody somewhat isolated so they can hear each other better. One of the really cool tricks that I learned a long time ago was when you have a singer that wants to play without headphones, set up two speakers, put one completely out of phase with the other, and then 
put them exactly between the microphones that are, and make a triangle out of it. And what that will do is it'll the speakers will cancel each other out, so you won't be dealing with as much or as much uh, bleed through. But your singer will be able to sing without headphones. That's interesting. Yeah, I love that idea, and I've heard it before. I've messed with it, but I've never really pulled it off. So it uh, might take a little bit more experimenting for me too, but it's a cool concept. It basically says that when your two speakers are out of phase, when their sound arrives at the microphone, hopefully they're canceling each other out and the mic's not hearing so much of those speakers. The mic's mostly just hearing the voice of the singer who's right in front of it, right? Right, exactly. And it works. that technique works really well if you're using an, a cardioid microphone, um, SM58s in particular seem to benefit, seem to be one of the best mics for that. Okay, cool. And so you uh, set that up in kind of a triangle, an equilateral triangle yeah. or something? Yeah, one of them kind of triangles. One of them. <laughs> one of them. All right, cool. Well, let's move forward. So now um, I want to make a couple of comments too. We'll, we'll, we'll jump back. We'll take the Wayback Machine again here to uh, our band, Enormous Richard and Eleanor Roosevelt and the recordings we did with you. And I remember that, you know, we went through, we kind of did a full circle, Meg. So the first recording we did was this live to cassette thing where all the mics are going through the console straight mixed down to a cassette and captured. And, you know, of course, I remember being acutely aware. Well, I was at first I was just thrilled, excited. In fact, I remember as Chris and I were uh, and the rest of the band, we left the scene there to go over to um Jerry's uh, wiffle ball field. There was sort of a famous uh, wiffle ball field over in Granite City, Illinois. And we went over there and we, we you know, um, of course, I think we'd all been uh, smoking a little celebratory something after the recording <laughs> session. And we show up at the wiffle ball field and we're listening to the tunes. And it was like the first time we ever heard ourselves recorded. It was, we, were, we felt like rock stars. It was like, man, this sounds killer, you know? And then shortly after that, I was like, oh, I didn't like all my mistakes and stuff. And then, you know, maybe it took me a year after that to finally come full circle again and say, and realize that the mistakes were what was kind of cool about it. But my point is, then we went on to do records with you where we did multi-track. We got, um, I guess we did eight track next, right? The eight track cassette, we did mm -hmm. it for um, both Answers, answers all, your all Your Questions and then for Warm Milk on the Porch. And mm -hmm. that was a really different experience. Um, and then finally we came full circle. Oh, and then we did a Walker with Web's, his head down. Yeah, was Walker. Like 16 track, right? And I was yeah. going to recording school too. And I distinctly remember coming to the session with you guys. Now, one thing that was cool is I was ready to be prepared. So like I met with the band before we went in on the first day of the session. Um, you know, we went out for, for beers one night and I, I drew out a whole chart on a piece of paper where we broke every song down into 16 tracks and we planned out what was going to fit on the tracks mm -hmm. and what kind of overdubs we could use. And of course, you know, my thinking was like 16 tracks, we better use them all, you know? <laughs> But, um, but that was kind of cool because we invented a lot of cool parts. Um, and then we went into the studio. And the funny thing that I did was I had just learned about things like, you know, there's a ring and the snare drum. You got to watch out for that or whatever. So I'm like, we must have spent an hour of me fucking around with the snare drum sound with you and like, you know, driving you and Matt nuts as I was insisting that Matt put an O-ring on a snare. Then we do all, we put blankets on it, all this crazy stuff. You know, of course, it's like, who gives a shit? Nobody cared about the ring. The ring didn't even matter in, this, in the recording. There was no ring. But anyway, <laughs> I just, I think that's an, something that everybody can relate to a little bit is that, you know, once you get into the engineering stuff, you start to think you know stuff that you need to pay attention to. And you might forget, you know, what the meaning of the music is along the way. Do you remember, uh, tell us what you remember about Walker with his head down in that session. What I remember most was we spent a lot of time with Matt and Jay, the drummer and bass player, um, working with the click track and just to just to get the tempos down. And what we did was we we did a thing where we before we actually track the actual take, we would uh, practice with the click track. So all the little parts that were like we prior to that we were rushing into different sections and rushing out of different sections. And I remember once we did that, it seemed to tighten up everything a lot. The other thing I remember is we spent we did spend a lot of time with getting all the drum sounds and everything just right, and I think that really made a huge difference in the sound. That was my main recollections of that. We were two weeks in the studio. We were every single day, all yep. day, and everybody in the got their 
everybody got there bright and early every morning. It was like we literally had that studio all to ourselves for two whole weeks. It was pretty awesome, man. So there's a kind of a ridiculous anecdote I want to share with you from a little story from beginning that record. I don't know if you remember this, but this is back when um, the band lived in, you know, the band house on Marconi over in, over in the hill in St. Louis. It was actually an old funeral home. And, I didn't and, know that. Yeah, it, was, it used to be a funeral home. And I think maybe in the basement where the, you know, the laundry machine was is where they stored all the you know, <laughs> bodies and stuff. But um, so I had gone over to the band house to spend the night before we went into the studio because um, I was just, you know, with everybody getting ready and I just slept there. And so I slept on the, cra- the couch by the front wall in, in Chris's room. And we went to bed that night. We were going to get up early the next morning, go to the studio. Uh, on the other side of this wall was the street. And there wasn't a window really to look out of, but you could kind of, you know, there was some glass block or something like that. And I had parked my car out there on the street to go, you know, for the night. And I remember as I was going to sleep on the couch, the last thing I heard before I fell asleep was the sound of a car starting. And I thought to myself, oh, geez, that... That sure does sound a lot like my car engine. And then I was like, (laughs) falling asleep, right? So then the next morning we get up to go to the studio and I walk out, my car is gone. It's gone. I remember that. It it had, you remember that? It had been stolen because I think I used to keep, it didn't lock or something. And I used to keep a spare key in my glove compartment. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I mean, it was a junky car. This is a car I moved down to Nashville in. This is the car, I, the very same car that I first heard Smells Like Teen Spirit in, you know, on local college radio. It's one of my stories about being here in Nashville. It was the uh, the Ford Escort station wagon that I had sprayed, spray painted silver, including the tires and the wheels and everything, the whole thing. The glass was not silver. Everything else was silver. <laughs> so, and it was a piece of crap. You know, it's like, I don't even think the clutch worked anymore. So what happened was, you know, the car, the, uh, well, let, here, let me, I'll get back to this. So we went into the studio that morning and I was like, uh, you know, OMG. Of course, I didn't say that back then, but OMG, what am I going to do? My car has been stolen and we're going into the studio to record for two weeks. Well, first off, I, I think I took a break somewhere during the day and I called the police to try and report my car stolen. And they said, well, what's your license plate number? And everything. I was like, um, she said, I really don't remember my license plate number. I'm sorry. Well, what's, what's your VIN number? You know? And I was like, Um, I'm really sorry, guys. I don't think I, I'm not organized enough to keep that anywhere. So they wouldn't let me report my car stolen. So then I just kind of hung up the phone and I was frustrated. I was like, well, you know, we got a record to make. So we went for a week making the record and I couldn't report my car stolen. Finally, like, you know, summer during the week, a piece of mail came in and it happened to have, I was in trouble for something I'm sure already. And it happened to have my VIN number on it. And so I called back and I tried to report it stolen and they told me, yeah, whatever, dude, your car was towed away, you know, that very same night. And it's been in the city lot for the last week uh, because it was such a junky car that the thieves stole it and they couldn't start it again at a stoplight <laughs> and they abandoned it down the street. So then the police were trying to accuse me of, of you know, falsifying a, a stolen car report because, uh, you know, they figured I was just drunk and left it somewhere. Um, so, but the, the reason I'm telling this story too, aside from the absurdity of it and how absurd I can be sometimes, is that that two weeks for us to be in the studio, Meg, to make our record, to do our thing. Like, I didn't give a shit about anything, dude. I didn't even care about mm-hmm. my cars being stolen. I was just like, all I wanted to do was be in there every day <laughs> recording. So rock stars, I, I, I share that with you because hopefully you feel that way. You know, hopefully you have felt that way. Maybe you don't if you're my age now, but you know, that <laughs> desire to be in the studio recording so much, you just like nothing else can matter at that point. Mm-hmm. All right. So Meg, back to you. We were in the studio for two weeks. What are some other things that you remember about that record? I mean, I remember we worked really hard on vocals. I remember we had like Neumann U87s to record with too. That was a new thing for us. We had a pair of Neumann U87s, a pair of KM84 mics for the overheads. Um, I brought in my collection of, I think it was D112, two SM58s and five SM57s, all of which I still have. That Dude, that's a, a sharp memory there. 
<laughs> Probably because it's all of which you still have, right? Yeah, I still I still use those a lot. Those are still some go-to mics for me for a lot of stuff. I kind of um, ab- admire your lack of gear envy. You know, you sort of, you got <laughs> what you needed initially and it's like, I'll just, you know, aside from probably buying a new computer every so many years, you probably got the same stuff you started with. I, I still have a lot of the same. I mean, I've added to it over time. You know, I've got I've got a, a collection. I've got a couple of ribbon mics. I've got I've got a, a tube mic, tube condenser mic. I've got a, a whole bunch of different. I've I've added to it, but I still keep the old gear because it's that character thing. At the time I had it, I would curse the SM57s. Now I know when to go to them for particular tones. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Well, they're great mics for sure. Well, so now uh, I wanted to sort of bring this whole thing full circle too and, you know, leave off with Crumbling in the Rain, those sessions. So Mm -hmm. if you remember, we did those sessions in your house in Maplewood and um, we set up the whole band in that big wooden wide open living room space with, you know, the drums, you hit the snare drum and that sound is like carrying up the old banistered wooden staircase. Yeah. And not only that, but this time around, we decided to set up the PA. Do you remember that? We didn't use any headphones. We ran all of our mics, vocal mics, in to be recorded, but they also fed the PA so that that was our live sound. And we recorded the entire thing live to DAT to track. Yep, I remember that. And that was, yeah, we used the DAT machine. And I think at that point, I had a sound tech board. Um, and a full rack of like compressors and EQs and reverbs and everything. So we, I think we had been going through all that stuff. My band had been rehearsing in that space and we had gotten in the habit of recording all of our rehearsals. So when it was time to record you guys, it was, I remember it being a very, it was basically just unplugging one set of instruments and plugging in another set of instruments. Yeah. And, um, some other takeaways I remember is that our guitars were too loud at first, the amps. So what mm-hmm. we did was we turned the amp volumes down as low as we could get away with and still get great tones. And then we just sort of put up all the couch pillows around them. And that sort of baffled them off from the area where we were. But it was such a good feeling. Like you were able to play just mm-hmm. like you were rehearsing with the band. Chris was right there in front of us singing on the mic. I was singing harmonies. Maybe not always my best harmonies, <laughs> but <laughs> but you know we're like playing together and it feels like a real band performance. And we're just every take was simply going for like let's all just try and knock this one out of the park and do our best performance ever. Exactly. Yeah. It was. I remember it was. It was a really fun record. It was a really fun record to make. And once again, I think we did something like thirty songs in a couple of days. Yep. <laughs> and and um, but the biggest takeaway for me at the time. Uh, was that, so we would record it down to DAT. And then of course, if you wanted to decide how well you did, you'd, you'd dump it to cassette and then you take the cassette out to the car and go listen to that. So this was like, you know, it was me recording with you, Meg and, and enormous Richard that I had my first experiences of the value of the car jam, you know, taking the yeah. songs out to the car, balancing levels that way. If we didn't like the mix, we'd go back in and we'd like adjust the fader slightly and we'd go perform the song again. But one of the things that I first really experienced was the incredible power of having uh, less stuff in the chain. So all the mics were going through a clean console sound straight down to the debt and everything was a very pure sound, right? It was. Uh, we did. We did use a couple of compressors in there. I do remember that. Like I think I put. I patched them in on the insert jacks. We used my live board. My live. My live mixing board. You had the DBX compressor with the slider. On yeah. It, I think, right. Yeah, that was what we used on the bass, and then we used um, let's see, a DBX one hundred and sixty X on the probably on the vocals is what yeah. I used it for. And then I had a one hundred and sixty six X, which we used for which we would probably use one side for the kick and one side for the snare. Yeah, maybe (laughs) so. And one of the takeaways, another one I learned from that session, we did some songs where the drums are playing live and the acoustic guitar is playing live as well. And remember, Rockstars, um, this is with PA only or, you know, no headphones. I don't think I had a PA monitor. I don't think I had a wedge for where I was at the guitar. I think I just heard the drums and heard everything coming from the other room, which means I had to be close enough with the acoustic to hear it. And what we stumbled on was that these are some of our best drum sounds ever because the acoustic guitar became the room mic for the drums. Yeah. Yep. And it was like, you know, Chris always liked to, uh, he always liked to say real nice stuff about our own recordings, but one of them 
was to say that this sounded like Exile on Main Street for him, you know, from the Rolling Stones. <laughs> and again, it's that sort of sound that says, um, you know, let's say you're going to record drums. We just had a 157 as an overhead for the drums. And then mm-hmm. I think we had a 57 on the top of the snare and a D112 in the kick, and that was it. Those were our three mics on the on the drums. So the room mic was that acoustic guitar over at the doorway to that room. And it's a powerful sound. In fact, I remember leaving those sessions feeling like a better room sound on something is a mic that's being used for another instrument rather than a dedicated room mic that you're trying to blend into a mix. One other thing that was really cool about that session, we had Chris's vocal going through the DBX 160X. Whenever he was whenever he was singing, he would be right in front of the mic. He had a habit of backing away from the mic whenever he wasn't singing, which was awesome because then the compressor, because of the compressor, the the natural instrument sound would always pick up, would always get a little louder in the mix when he'd step away from it. That's awesome, dude. That's a great takeaway. I've forgotten about that and I never really yeah. thought about that. I like it, man. I like talking about our own records. <laughs> Thanks, Rockstars, for letting us do that. Um, well, so Meg, let's, uh, you know, we're going on here, having lots to talk about. Let's keep jumping forward. Um, you know, you've already talked about getting some some cool drum sounds. One of the things that I learned from you was how to get a great kick drum sound. And that was when I came out to your LA studio and you told me about the, uh, I think they're called the Power Stroke Heads. Tell us about getting great drum sounds. What have you learned about drum heads and things you need on the instrument? Well, one of the most important things I've learned is good quality drum heads. That's like the most important thing. I've recently switched to Diodario drum heads or the, the Evans drum heads, which are made by Diodario. Um, the Evans drum heads, I don't, I don't know the model numbers because I had somebody else <laughs> put them on, but I've got brand new heads on all my studio kit. The person that put them on knew exactly what he was doing. He tuned them right. Good drum heads good drum set and your set and good cymbals. That's what you need. Um, what are some of the things, uh, you know, without getting into the model number or the brand number, what are some aspects of those heads on a kick drum that seem to add up to make a really nice kick sound? The, the most important thing is you want to have a kick drum that, it depends on the song, first of all. You want to have a kick drum that's not too ringy. You want to put the kick drum in the right room. Ideally, you want a room that's big. You don't want a small room because when you have a small room, the waves, you'll get all these weird frequency aberrations. In my studio, my studio is in my house. The entry into this room is a, is about an 80-inch entry, about the size of a patio door, but there's no door in place. So what happens for me to help get a good drum sound is I'm not dealing with a lot of standing waves because all the, all the waves will have room to expand outside of this room which is a good thing. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, so it's like the sound has somewhere to go. Yeah, the sound has somewhere to go. Those bass frequencies don't build up around the kick drum. They they project out into the other rooms, and that makes a big difference. So takeaway as rock stars, you want your sound to leave your drums. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Although it's pretty one loud. Of the, one of the things I always, whenever I go, to, go into people's home studios, one of the issues that I see a lot is people try their best to damp everything. They'll put you know, foam everywhere and all that. To me, it doesn't work. That kind of acoustical treatment doesn't work very well because what ends up happening, unless you're correcting a specific problem, it's better to leave the room natural and maybe just, you know, dampen the corners, reduce some of the uh, flutter echoes, things like that, as opposed to trying to dampen every last sound and get a perfectly flat room. Um, because you never do get a perfectly flat room, right? You you don't. And when, once you start trying to fix one problem, you'll open up another set of problems. The frequencies that weren't canceling out are now canceling out because other frequencies have canceled those ones out. You know, you have problems like that. Man, that's a lot of canceling. A lot that's of cancellations. Cancel. Yeah, a lot of cancellations. Cancellations are bad in the studio. All right, Meg. Most so we've time. discussed... Um, a lot of the elements of recording and you've given us some great tricks. You know, my final takeaway from those live to two track sessions when we did crumbling in the rain is we sort of went full circle from live performing through multi-track and learning the studio trickery and coming all the way back around to live performing. And we discovered for our band, it was like everything that was ever good about what we did was, had something to do with us performing it and, you know, something happening in the moment and, 
as opposed to being, you know, perfectly delivered. Um, exactly. So that was a great thing that I learned. So I thank you for that. Today, I thank you, Megan. That's my that's my recording prayer to you for the day. <laughs> thank you for teaching me the value of recording to two track and getting a live performance. I really enjoy watching the um, the videos that you guys do from from your studio. Those are really fun to watch. Oh, stereo sessions. Yeah, stereo sessions. Those are those are really cool. Like you get some great performances out of those. Thanks very much, man. Rockstars, if you'd like to check that out, you can go to stereosessions.com. That'll take you straight to our page with, uh, and it's also on our YouTube channel, but we were doing a series of live performances from the studio. Same thing. I would mix it live through the console and we would shoot all the video with iPhones and uh, inexpensive cell cams. And that, and that was pretty fun. Well, so Meg, I want to jump forward here and shift gears a little bit to talk to you about, you know, the, what happens to this record once you've made it, you know, what have you learned about the value of a record? You know, you talked about, making sure you understand the publishing, but obviously a record feels valuable to us when we record it, but what does the rest of the world think about it? And what have you learned about that? If you can listen to your own recording a lot, then it'll be easy for other people to listen to it a lot. One of my favorite things to do is when I, if I find myself skipping over a song when I, after I've recorded it, that means the song is not done yet. But to answer your question... I think what one of the value, you know, the value is a it helps get your fan base out there, or helps you know get you new fans when you put it out there as a release. If you're able to get it placed into a film or a TV show, a lot of times you will get very good money for that, depending on on what you sign away and all that kind of stuff. But film and TV placements can be really, really good. And the other thing, you know, overall for any anybody that puts music out there, the big thing to do is promote, promote, promote. That means put putting Facebook posts up, um, recording small projects very frequently as opposed to one large project. Mm -hmm. You know, just basically getting things out there. That's one other thing I would like to tell all the rock stars out there. When you're recording music, one of the things to do is to do small chunks of songs and put them out. What that does is it gives your fans time or it gives them multiple reasons to come back and listen to songs. Most people will listen to one or two songs at a time. If you put a 10-song CD out there, then you'll most likely get, you know, a lot of people just listen to one or two songs anyway. If you put a three-song EP out there and you do four sets of those, you'll most likely get four songs listened to by fans. Nice, man. So it's like a steady delivery of content. It's the concept of content marketing, which sure sounds bland in the face of talking about rock and roll, right? Yeah. But I mean, it is kind of at the essence of getting your message out, whatever it is. The podcast is content marketing. Sorry, rock stars, you are participating in content marketing <laughs> right now, this very moment. It's a fact. You know, it's just that idea of getting your, whatever your creation is, out over and over again so that people really have a a chance to become familiar with it and get to know it and be reminded of it, I guess. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, and the other thing too, that I tell people to do, if you can videotape your sessions, especially if you're doing them live stereo sessions, people, when people have content where they can see the band, that is far more powerful than just a recording without a video. Yeah. Something to think about. Yeah, and I, th I remember when you got into that too, you picked up a, a GoPro camera and you're just, you know, can find a good shot and it'll pretty much pick up the whole band with a little bit of the fisheye, right? Yeah, yeah. And like now my wife and I both got really good cameras, DSLR cameras. And what we do is we set up we set up two to three cameras now and whenever we have a band come over and we'll do like, we usually will do three cameras now, one wide shot, one medium shot and one close up of the singer or the soloist that's handheld. And we'll just run those during the, during the performance of the song and then edit them together. That's good advice. My takeaway from doing stereo sessions was that handheld shots are almost always more valuable than a static shot. So it, as best you can always get handheld shots because they just have life in them, you know, and they, they, you know, there's, you can see the perspective of somebody, uh, you know, who's a human being watching the performance as opposed to just having it on a, on a stand. Yeah. The purpose of the wide shot, like you always, like it's a good idea to always have one wide shot. So you have something to cut to 
for whatever reason, and also to establish the scene at the beginning and at the end of the performance. Yeah. And then the handhelds in between are the gold mine. That's that's exactly what you said, Lidge. It's like you get you get the handhelds in there and it feels like people are right there. Right. And so what should you be shooting with your handheld? Shoot whatever the damn thing is that's going on right there in that moment. If somebody's yeah. singing a lyric, make sure you've got the picture of the singer's face singing, you know? If somebody's taking a guitar solo, make sure you've got a camera on that finger taking a you know shot of the guitar solo so you can cut to it in that moment. And it really helps. I mean, I know we're getting into like video production here and filmmaking. And now you're really talking like you're from Hollywood, Megan. So thank you for <laughs> thank you for doing that. Now, um, what about, um, you know, I think one of the things that was really remarkable in your career is you went into artist development and management and production. And you, you've worked with independent artists where you brought them in, you guys collaborated on recording a record, and then you very diligently kept track of everything that was done after the record and the touring and the promotions so that you could um, actually, you know, keep track of the of the money and, and make sure that you guys broke even. And then I, I think went into profit. I mean, you could tell us more about that, but even just breaking even for a record budget that was fully produced and mixed and mastered and distributed and, and released, I thought was a really remarkable story from the indie, indie side of things. Can you tell us some lessons you learned about that? Yeah, one of the big things uh, when, you're, when you're recording is if you track your expenses and your income really, really tightly, um, it's possible to actually break even. That means that when you when you go out and tour, you, you sit there and you, you track, you know, you, when, whenever you make money, you write it down and you write down your, all your merchandise stuff. You make sure that you're not, you know, it's good to give away stuff, but you actually make money if you sell your product as well. So that's an important thing. Like, don't be afraid to sell your product to people. Yeah. Um, merchandising is another really important facet. You get t-shirts, you know, if, if the band is playing live, then t-shirt sales can sometimes make a tour. You get a good t-shirt design and, you know, you'll be able to make good money. The other thing to do is compilation. Like if you're doing is to do compilation CDs. So every, you know, every time you get like three EPs or four EPs down, then you can burn a compilation CD or nowadays put up a compilation CD on iTunes. One other big note, iTunes is where you're going to make the bulk of your profits at compared to any of the other uh, digital distribution outlets. You're going to make, I know with the bands that I've worked with, usually 70 to 80% of the actual income comes from the iTunes sales. Very interesting. So now, who do you feel is your customer on iTunes? In your experience, do you feel like every customer who purchased the record on iTunes was somebody that you already knew and sent there? Or do you feel like there was discovery as well? It was it was a combination of both. Um, with, with some of the artists, we did a lot of online promotion. And so what happens with the online, like when you put, when you post videos up, and you post the you post links up. People who are curious about the artist will tend will will follow those links. If you if you put links up to things like Spotify and all that versus iTunes, if you put your iTunes links first and feature them, that's a really good move to help drive sales. Yeah. Um, and if you put links up to like you know Spotify, you get a lot of streams, but you, you're not going to make any sales on Spotify. Why do you think somebody in this day and age buys a record? If I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> so somebody I, goes to iTunes. Um, is there a user experience they think is real positive there as far as people buy a record and then it's on their phone for easy listening later? Or is it often an, a, you know, an act of support because they appreciate an artist and they know that they're supporting an artist? I think the, both of those ideas are are valid. I think sometimes it's people that want to support an artist. I've done that where I've seen an artist's CD on, on at iTunes that I know, and I'll be like, you know what? I'm going to buy it so I can help support them. Other times it's like, hey, I want that because I want to be able to play it. I don't want it to come off Spotify's playlist. Spotify, you're going to get a lot of people that are going to stream your music and listen to it, but you're not going to get as many people you know, you're not going to get a lot of actual turnover. You're not going to get a lot of people purchasing your music. If you set up your primary links to iTunes, you're going to get a lot more people downloading your music. Yeah, that or, makes sense. Or, yeah. So that's that's basically what one of the bits of advice is always send people to iTunes or or some kind of a merching, merch location where you can actually sell your discs or yeah. sell your music as opposed to just 
as opposed to just free streaming. Okay, so Meg, one of the things that I remember learning from you back when was as you managed an artist who was out touring, you were very conscious of your methods of communicating and promoting in that city that they were about to go play a show at. What What's the carryover now? How should somebody be aware of promoting? And I, Rockstars, I, I thank you for allowing us to go on a little bit of a tangent to talk about this promoting for a band, but I think it's really important because you, it might, you might be in a band yourself or you might be working with artists that are coming in to make a record with you. And, you know, let's be honest, if they're going to pay you to make a record with them, if they don't know how to go out and recoup on that record, this may not last very long. You know what I mean? So tell us what people need to know now, some great takeaways for successfully promoting shows and growing a tour base. First of all, identify your basic forms of media. Biggest way for people to discover bands nowadays is YouTube and Facebook. Um, so the first thing you want to do is put your put your music out there on YouTube and Facebook um, when you're going into an area and identify, try to identify fans from that area. Second thing I would do is look up the radio stations. There's two types of radio stations you're going to want to hit. One is the independent radio stations, which will have like a lot of different formats. Look for one or two shows that would fit the music that you that you are promoting. Usually it's just one or two on those stations. Find those, hit up the DJ like a couple months in advance before you go in that market because sometimes, you know, they'll if they pick up on it, they'll play your music and help promote the gig. Next item is you get your newspapers. They still do, a lot of newspapers have online online things, so you want to make sure to get on the concert calendar. You want to make sure to um, see if a reporter will write you up uh, for both online and, and paper versions. Usually it's the online version that you want to get written up for. If there is a, if it's a club, make sure that they've got all the details, including set times, and ask them if they can put posters up. Send them posters, um, little eight and a half by eleven, all the way up to the big eleven by seventeen posters or eighteen by twenty-four. It helps drive a lot of attention to the band. Those are the big things that I would tell everybody to do. And also do these well in advance of the show. At least start your prospecting for these well in advance. Every market, going back to newspapers, every market will have a local indie rag. Um, in St. Louis, for example, it was the Riverfront Times. And they'll also have a major paper like the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. You want to hit both of those as well as any other indie magazines and things like that that are out there or online magazines. Any blog posters in those areas? People like that, you want to you want to get them your music if you can. Did you always sort of have a checklist that you referred to to make sure for each town you were checking off all these items? Exactly. Going to? Yeah, I got. I actually have a checklist that's basically exactly what I just outlined. It's it's your internet, your radio, your poster flyers, and then the other thing too. It's very minimal amount, but sometimes you can get. Sometimes there's these. Uh, local afternoon shows, depending on the band and everything. They have these local news segment shows in the afternoon. It's very easy for a band that's touring to get onto these. You just have to bring your own mini soundboard and do an acoustic set. But a lot of times these these places will allow you to do that. So Interesting. It's, always worth it's always worth checking in on a radio station. I had one artist that went through Arizona and she did a, um, she did one show, but that show was shown in all three major markets in in Arizona, which is really cool. She went up and did like a a segment on Good Day Arizona, right. and it that that show hit Flagstaff and Tucson and Phoenix all in one fell swoop. Do you remember feeling like you guys saw results of that exposure, like it translated somehow? It, it minor, but it was like it's one of those things when you have media. If you do multiple outlets, it all builds up on each other. Like people might say, oh yeah, I, I, I remember this, but it, in reality that they will have seen that name of that artist in several different locations before they, before they make the thing. It makes the artist seem bigger. It makes it more exciting for the listener or for the, the fan, the music fan to go, Hey, I should really check this person out. Yeah. All right. So now you mentioned getting to know those areas and know who your fans are in those areas. You talked about YouTube and Facebook. Are there some ways that you can identify who the fans are that you're trying to uh, know about in different areas? There's a new tool that I recently came across. There's a company called Band Square, B A N D S Q U A R E. They have a really killer tool 
that I was recently turned on to by John Lennock. That tool allows a, a band to find where their fans are coming from and allows the fans to let the artist know where they're from directly. Best way to find out about it is go to bandsquare.com. It's a really great tool, um, and it's especially useful for bands that are in the middle and early stages of their career. Very cool. And I know that sometimes if you're building an email list, for example, when people sign up, sometimes your email list like MailChimp will capture location for people too. So it can actually, you can have people put in their zip code, for example, and then that yeah. way you sort of know where they're from. All right. So cool. We're, you know, we're going off on a little bit of a tangent there, which is great. Um, Rock says, I hope you don't mind that. I know as a producer and engineer in, my, in a studio, my studio, I've had many, many conversations with artists where they feel like they need some advice on, you know, what to do with their records. So it can be a really good tool for us as producers and engineers, studio owners, to be able to empower the artists we work with, especially new ones with, here's some good ideas, you know, here's stuff you could try. One other thing I would tell artists at the early stages is if you can, a lot of times it's hard to get a big bar gig or a big venue gig. First time when you, when you, Pick a route that you're going to develop over the course of a year or two. When you do that route, start by going into the coffee shops and look for open, you know, open mics if you can or singer-songwriter nights. Expect your first tour to be a loss where you just go into like, you know, you get your route going. Let's say you're in Los Angeles. You then go to, you know, San Diego, Flagstaff, Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona, El Paso. Just make a little route that's linear or a circle and try to find venues in all those little towns along the way. That's usually a really good way to develop your audience. Have you seen artists have more success coming up with a great uh, circuit through small, unexpected areas than the ones that say, oh, we only want to go play Chicago, and then we're going to go try and do New York and all these bigger, bigger markets? I have a story from my friend Lal Tolhurst. Um, before The Cure were really big, when they first came to America— they went through and they played a lot of small towns throughout California. They didn't play San Diego and Los Angeles. They played Stockton, Modesto, all these little tiny, tiny towns all along California. At a certain point, they got booked into an amphitheater show. At the same time, there was another band, a very large band that got booked, that had a number one single that also booked an amphitheater show at, at the same amphitheater right around the same time. The tickets went on sale about two weeks apart. The Cure were... The promoter was like, yeah, I'm just kind of doing this on a chance. I, you know, you guys haven't really played any venues that are at the right size. So I don't know how, you know, how good you guys are going to do. Turned out that The Cure sold out that show completely on the first day at wow. Irvine, at what is Irvine Meadows. And it was because of all the legwork that they did of playing all those small little towns before they went up and did the big town. Cool, man. I love hearing that story. It's great stuff. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, uh, if you've got one, can you spin that on the studio and in our experience as studio owners, producers, engineers? Have you seen some great examples of reaching out and finding clients for studios? You know, what are some of the ways that you like to, or what are the ways that you find most effective as far as bringing in new clients, bringing people into your studio? Word of mouth. When you take those small little gigs for people that don't pay very much, do your best. Don't, you know, nickel and dime them because a lot of times those people will end up referring you to somebody else who will have, you know, much bigger budgets and they'll rave about the experience that they had at your studio. For my studio, I don't do a lot of promotion. Um, I've taken out ads a few times, but those weren't really huge. My biggest experience was, uh, my biggest source of clients has always been previous clients, which have been built up over time. Right on, man. All right, well, Rockstars, we're going to take a break right now, and, and then we'll come back in for the jam session in just a moment. Uh, before we do, I want to remind you that our guest, Megan Gohill, we're going to have all links to what we're talking about, hollywoodrecordingstudio.com in the show notes, which you can find at rsrockstars.com, and then search for Megan, M-E-G-H-A-N, or on your iPhone or your other podcast device, just look for the show notes right there while it's playing, and you can click through with your finger. I also want to let you about know about some cool stuff that's going on at Recording Studio Rockstars. We now have, speaking of swag, Megan, we now have t-shirts. 
T-shirts. So I'm really excited about that. Just go to rsrockstars.com slash T-shirt and grab yourself a recording studio rock star T-shirt of your very own. And not only that, but when I talk about record sales and promotions, I released my record, Skadoosh, which has the soundtrack, the theme song for recording studio rock stars. Black Sabotage is the, I believe it's the second track on the record. So you can go get that or go check it out if you've ever been curious to hear the rest of the theme song for the podcast. Go to skadooshmusic.com. That's S-K-A-D-O-O-S-H music.com. All right, rock stars, we'll see you guys in a moment for the jam session. Hey everybody, it's Lid Shaw, and I want to thank you so much for listening to this episode of Recording Studio Rockstars. I really appreciate you, and I really appreciate your time. And as a way of saying thank you, I've created a special mix tutorial just for you, Rockstars, totally free, called the Mix Master Bundle. With it, you get over two hours of detailed videos watching over my shoulder as I mix a song in my studio. Plus, I give you the free ebook that explains how I recorded the tracks and you get downloadable multi-tracks so that you can practice your mixes, including the Pro Tools session file, using nothing but stock plugins in Pro Tools, all of which you would find in any other DAW, whether you're on Logic or Studio One or Reaper. Maybe you're struggling with trying to improve your mix technique, or maybe you just simply don't have access to multi-track files or can't record a full drum set in your studio. I wanted to give you a chance to create your own mixes from full drum drum kit, bass, and guitars recorded in my studio. The song is called American Winter, and it's off my instrumental record, Skadoosh, and it's all available for you totally free right now. All you need to do to get it is text Mix Master Bundle to 33444, and I'll send it directly to your email. Again, that's Mix Master Bundle with no space to 33444. 444, or you can go directly to mixmasterbundle.com, enter your email, and I'll send all the files directly to you. Thanks so much, rock stars. We'll see you guys in the jam session. Cheers. Hey, rock stars, we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Megan Gohill from HollywoodRecordingStudio.com. Super psyched to have you here on the show with us. Megan, are you ready to jam? I am ready to jam. Sweetness, dude. <laughs> when you were starting out and recording, what was one of the things that was really holding you back? I would say at the very, very start, I thought it was the equipment. Uh, looking back in hindsight, it was having the equipment that I had was perfect. Um, you know, just a small cassette recorder and starting with that. Nice. So simple equipment is enough. As long as you can record something, you're ready to start recording. Exactly. It allows you to focus on your songs and the, the basic elements of everything. Would you say to somebody who really, really has limited resources right now, if you've got an iPhone and that's all you got, start making records? Exactly. If you've got an iPhone, you've got everything you need to make records. That's pretty cool, you know? man. That's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. And you know, like you can get little things like the uh, Apogee Jam, which is a really cool little device. Uh, lets you hook your guitar straight into your iPhone. You could get the uh, Apogee makes a little mic. There's a bunch of different mics, but Apogee makes a really nice one that you can hook directly into your iPhone. And, you know, with iPhone, you've got GarageBand, you've got all kinds of recording programs. It's like probably the best recording tool to ever come out. One of my favorites is Multitrack DAW, D-A-W. Check that one out, Rockstars. It's really quick and easy to work with. It's not the loop-based style that GarageBand is, but if you're just wanting an easy way to record your acoustic guitar and sing vocals into it and go, it's pretty awesome for that. All right, so Meg, how about sharing with us some of the best advice that you received about recording in the studio? One of the best pieces of advice I received ever was from Bill Porter, who was Elvis Presley and Roy Orbison's and the Everly Brothers engineer. Bill asked, I was taking a class, and Bill asked everybody, so what's the best mixer? And we're all sitting there saying, Neve, SSL. And he's like shaking his head at all of us. And he finally said, what do you think? And he said, air. And I'm like, <laughs> I've never heard of an air mixer, air brand. He goes, no, air. And we're like, what do you mean air? And he said, if you need to mix a horn section or a group of vocalists, get them all to gather around one microphone. They will blend themselves. You will not have to do any work. The blends you'll get are far better. 
Nice, man. You know, it's funny because I remember you talking about Bill Porter coming and teaching you there at Webster. And one of the takeaways that I still carry with me today is his advice. Do you remember this? He said, when you're mixing, always start by, at least as far as finding levels, two-track mix levels. If you solo your kick drum, it should be hitting about minus 10. Yeah. Below yep. your zero level. Now, that doesn't mean minus 10 dB full scale of a you know digital mix, but it meant minus 10 below the zero mark on your VU meter. Yeah. There's another piece of advice that I got that was really good from Bill also. Or actually, it wasn't Bill. It was somewhere else. But it's basically when you're mixing, you keep your levels, try to keep your levels so they're averaging around 79 to 82 dB. If you mix them too quiet, you're not going to get a properly balanced mix. If you mix too loud, everything will start to compress in the mix and you're going to be mixing against compression. So yeah, so trying to keep everything about 79 to 82 decibels on the average and peaks can go above that. But uh, And now we're uh, talking keep... about dBSPL. So in other words, if yeah. you held an SPL meter at your face in front of the speakers, the SPL meter would read that in the room. So what's hitting your ears is 79 to 82 dBSPL. Um, a weighting, B weighting, or C weighting, Megan? <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't remember. Dumb, blue. <laughs> dumb blue, yeah, exactly. Just whatever, you, if you turn it on and it works, good. Exactly. All right, All right so let's go to the next question. Um, this one's... Fun. You've already been sharing some, but give us another recording tip, hack, or secret sauce, something that our rock stars could use today in, the, in their studio. One of the best things that I learned to do was to take sounds, like a lot of times, for me personally, I get a lot of tracks from people where they'll plug in the instrument directly into the board or into the whatever DAW they're using. One of my favorite things to do is when they send me that, when they send me those tracks, I will use a reamp device, which allows me to take the line level signal that's coming out of Pro Tools and putting it and put it into a guitar amp. Mm -hmm. I don't just use it on guitars. I also use it on vocals. I've used it on an entire drum set. Um, I've used it on bass guitar. Almost any instrument you can put through there. And then I, re I track that with a ribbon mic set about a foot or two away. What that does is it gives me a, a bit of air to work from. So I can take the direct sound and then have a, a, um, another source of that same sound but with a little bit of air, and I can split that left and right, and it really adds a lot of depth to the recording. Interesting. That Bill Porter character telling <laughs> you to mix through air, and there you are doing it by reamping stuff. So Rockstars, again, the reamp box basically looks like a DI but it's designed for what Megan described to go through in reverse from your, you know, whatever your tape machine or your console or your Pro Tools is back into an amp as opposed to coming from, you know, a guitar signal and going into the computer. And I think it has a dial on it, right, where you can turn it, you can set the level going into the amp, Meg? It does. It has a dial on it. It has a little uh, a, a switch so you can ground lift if you need to. And, and I think it's purple, right? Mine is yellow. Oh, yours is yellow. All right, cool. Well, I don't yellow know if that sounds purple. different. Yeah. They're both good. Um, so I know that was a hard piece of hardware, but I'm going to ask you again, man, share with us also a favorite hardware tool for the studio, something that when you do sessions, you're kind of always glad you've got this physical thing with you. Okay, I know exactly what that is. A patch bay. <laughs> uh -huh. The patch bay. The patch bay. Recording Studio Rockstars, the patch bay is a gold mine. It will speed up your sessions to such an amazing extent. I have a patch bay. I've got every piece of hardware gear that I own run through a run through a 96-point patch bay. And what that does for me, it means that if I need to change something, I can do it without having to reach back behind the board and unplug and replug something back there. I just do a patch cable. I don't need to worry about digital switching from one thing to another. I can just do it all at the patch bay. And Rockstars, if you haven't used a patch bay before and you heard him say 96 points and you're like, 96, I only got one piece of whatever. Uh, 96 is really 48 on top and 48 on the bottom. So 48 ins, 48 outs. And those 48 is really 24 on the left, 24 on the right. And trust me, those patch points will disappear so quickly in your studio <laughs> because just your interface alone probably, you know, has at least eight, maybe 16, 24, 32 inputs and outputs. And you may want to have all those at the patch bay. 
Another little patch bay that I like, there's two two of the, Two ones that I've gotten. One is a Switchcraft, which is really nice. And I use that for all my TTL, which is a type of a connector. Tiny, it's a tiny connector so you can Tiny have a bunch telephone. Of points. Yes, TT. tiny telephone. TTL. TT or TTL? TT. Um, then the other one that I have is a Mamba XLR quarter inch patch bay. And that one lets me put a quarter inch or an XLR cable directly into my mic preamps. And I've got special cables that'll go from the TT cables to the, uh, to, into a, um, quarter inch. That's very cool. Yeah. You know, the ultimate patch bay that I always wanted, dreamed of, and maybe it's time to dream of it again, was to take all of my guitar pedals, all the, you know, like quarter inch guitar jack level gear and have it pre-patched in, in a pedal board with power going to everything, but have each pedal go to a quarter inch patch bay where when you're recording in the studio, you could patch anything and it would just drop it down, go through guitar pedals and come back in and patch it back into Pro Tools or record with it or use it as an outboard effect. I always thought that would be really awesome, but I never did it, man. Is it too late, Meg? Is it too late for me? It's never too late, Lidge. It's never too late. All right, cool, man. So now how about sharing with us a favorite software tool for the studio? Something really cool. Maybe it's a favorite. Maybe it's just something you've been checking out this week that you really think is awesome. You know what? I just got my favorite, my absolute favorite software plugin this week. Tell us. It just came out. Don't keep us in suspense. It's by Isotope. It's called Neutron. Oh, no, you got Neutron. Cool, man. Tell us a little bit about it. Well, I'll tell you this. I, at first, when I, when I heard about it, I was like, no, I don't need this. And then I tried it out. And as soon as I tried it out, I was hooked. What Neutron does is it allows you to go in at the track level and analyze that instrument against the rest of your mix. And then it pulls out, it, it gives you what it thinks you should pull out so it doesn't interfere with the other frequencies that are in your overall mix. It has EQ compressor, exciters, all that stuff in there, but it kind of goes through and figures out what it thinks you need, and then you can go in and further tweak those settings. It's a great way. It it just makes the whole process a lot faster. I've been using it by putting it in on subgroups. So like I'll put one in on the drum subgroup, one on the vocals, one on the bass, and I'll just do it that way to get to the sounds that I need. So Neutron says like, I really like robot rock I think you should try doing this, Megan. How do you like my mix? It pretty much does exactly that. <laughs> like the, the Daleks and Doctor Who? Ex- yes. <laughs> exterminate the frequencies. Sorry, guys. It, it goes It goes through and it'll, it finds those frequencies that are problem, like that are masking other things that you might not initially hear. And it, it goes through, dips those out. It accentuates other ones that probably need to be accentuated. It's not always, you know, it's one of those things, it's not always 100% accurate, but it saves a lot of time because it gets you in the ballpark a lot faster than if you were to try to do all this by hand. Yeah, I think it sounds super cool. And here's the other thing, right? So let's say you feel strongly about your own ability to start identifying those frequencies yourself and you don't want something to, quote, do it for you. You could still use the tool to have it identify things for you and point things out, and then you might go look at it. It might be, you know, once again, a visual aid to audio exercise, you know, where you're you're using this visual and it clues you into things. You're like, oh, yeah, I didn't really actually realize that I was having build up at the, you know, 125 or whatever whatever it was, and you, you go address it. So that's pretty awesome, man. I'm, I'm looking forward to trying it myself. I will say... I'm super duper impressed with Isotope. I use uh, Ozone. I use RX. Is like you have no idea, rock stars. RX is the plugin for podcasting. It's the the secret <laughs> magic that cleans up sound and makes sure everything sounds like you did it in a great radio studio. Um, yeah. Well, so cool, man. Now, how about a favorite tool for the business side of recording, Megan? You're you're a bit of a business whizness, you know, since I've always <laughs> known you. And and you used to be able to hack your way around databases before any of us knew what a database was. I've come across a really good product called Smartsheets, which allows you to put all of your projects on a... It, you can view your projects by... You, you take all the steps of your of a song, for example, and you put it up on a virtual on a virtual board. 
and you mm-hmm. can put it put it in things like these items are done, these items are in progress, these items we still need to do. You can put up put them up on a board, have each song be a separate tab, and then you can also assign calendar dates to everything. It will print up a calendar for you, so you can kind of see where you are with all of your projects. Cool, man. I it's like great, that. Great program. So it's kind of project management software that helps you keep track of all this nonsense. Yeah, and you can share it across with multiple people. It's it's a fantastic product. Um, cool. What's the name of it again? Smart Sheets. S M A R T Smart Sheets. Smart Sheets. Okay, cool, man. Uh, well, that's cool. Thank you for sharing that. And my next question was going to be, how about something for the organizational side of studio work? It sounds like that is one. Is Do you have another tool that you use regularly for just kind of staying organized? And, you know, how do you file your stuff? I, I do all my filing of stuff on hard drives. Um, I, I, make a pro, I make a folder for each artist. And then within each artist, I, I have a separate folder for each song. And then I have a folder for master recordings of that artist for the final mixes of everybody. Mm-hmm. So if, if an artist calls me up you know, five years later and says, hey, do you got blah, blah, blah. If I've already digitized it, I can find it pretty easily. Um, how do you store for long term? You got any tips for rock stars as far as how do you come back five years from now and find that thing? I wish I knew that in the long term. What I do right now is I'm, I'm I just keep buying bigger and bigger hard drives, and every so often I'll transfer all my old material to the new hard drives. Okay, so you sort of like to have maybe a pair of supersized hard drives that just have everything on them. Right. And hard drives keep getting bigger and getting cheaper. So, you know, when I first started, a 500 gig hard drive was very expensive. Now, a 500 gig hard drive is just, you know, what, 50 bucks? Yeah, right. Um, And so what I do, I keep the old hard drive intact, but I just add, move everything into the new hard drive as well and just keep adding to that. Cool, cool. All right. Well, I like that, man. It's like then you have redundancy, but... You also have one place to go look for everything when it's time to look for stuff. Um, Exactly. So now how about a, uh, this is hypothetical, but imagine you were starting over again and you needed to have some sort of simple setup to be able to record people, um, which I think you've been there in the past. You needed to find people to record and you needed to make some money so that you could survive, all of which you've done in the past. What would you, what would you do now? Or what advice would you have to somebody who's, who's in that state? Your your first step is just to get good at what you're doing before you can charge anybody. So that means practice. Call all your friends who play instruments, invite them over, give them a glass of beer, a glass of wine, coffee, have them record a bunch of songs, listen to it, invite them over again, ask them if they have any other friends. Keep doing that over and over again until you're really good at it. Then ask if you can go record a live gig. Go to the live gig, record it. You will learn a lot by recording a band or or an artist at a live gig. And you just keep doing that over and over again. And eventually you get to the point where you're so busy that you'll just, people will start, you know, you'll be so busy. You're like, I don't want to do this. That's when you start charging. Nice, man. I like that. And I also like that your studio you described doesn't have any water. It's all coffee, beer, and wine. (laughs) What's water? (laughs) Groovy, man. All right. Well, so now here's the very last closing question. And this one, again, is hypothetical. But we now have the Wayback Recording Machine. And we're going to go back Megan today is going to go back 20, 25 years and you're going to find young Megan and you're going to grab yourself by the scruff of the neck and hold yourself up against the wall and say, Megan, you listen to me here. Listen here. This is the advice I want to give you. <laughs> what what one piece of advice would you give yourself for how to become a rock star of the studio one day? Stay in touch with all your friends because as you get older, your friends get older. And when they get older, they get better at doing what they do, and you get better at doing what you do. I like that, man. I like that. And here we are. Here we are. You know, Plus, I you, stayed in touch with you, and you've gotten really good at this. And <laughs> Thanks, man. Plus, you just called us better at what we do, man. I, I like that. Thanks for the compliment. Yeah. <laughs> you too, man. <laughs> thank you. Well, Megan, thank you so much for joining us on Recording Studio Rockstars. You rock, dude. And uh, there's so much more to talk about, but we'll have to um, do that over a beer in person next time. Yes. Tell our listeners how they can find you, learn more about you, and all that. Go to hollywoodrecordingstudio.com, hollywoodrecordingstudio.com. And, and do you do you have services that you sort of extend um, that people might be able to take advantage of worldwide? 
Um, I do I do recording. If anybody wants to send me stuff to mix, I can uh, I can give you a rate sheet for that. Do you do consultation for all the promotional side and and stuff like that I, too? I will do consultation. Just send me an email, which is on my website, and I will I'll be more than happy to uh, to go over that. All right, groovy man. Well, thanks, dude. I appreciate you taking out time. I know you're a busy dude. I can hear hammering in the background. There, <laughs> you got the guys <laughs> installing the AC system in the studio. Yep. It's great hanging out with you. We'll you talk too? to you soon, dude, and we'll see you around the studio. Okay, talk to you later, Luke. All right, cheers, Bye. man. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444. And I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Thank you.